Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey, and I'm very much honored to be a part of Erie's celebration of the International Women's Day, the International Day for Women and Girls, and of course, it's March, so it's also International Women's Month. Um, I'm going to be moderating our first of, of a few podcast and video sessions uh, where we have panel discussions with our own experts in Erie, where we talk about a lot of the grand challenges that we are experiencing in science and technology. But um, for this specific panel discussion, we're going to be focusing on one particular issue that's, for me at least, not entirely new or groundbreaking, but at the same time, it's still a huge hindrance from women achieving, you know, fully achieving equality in science and technology. But you know, before I dive into the discussion, I'd first like to introduce our, my, my esteemed colleagues and our panelists for today's panel discussion beginning with Martina Castellon, the manager of Seed Health Unit of Erie. Pauline Chevenge, a senior scientist one for soil and nutrient management. And Peter Spram, scientist one for our agri-food policy platform. So um, thank you for taking up this challenge. I know that you guys are very busy, but I'm sure that uh, you will leave our viewers with quality takeaways on this very important matter or topic. So um, our main goal, speaking of takeaways, is that we want this discussion uh, for our panelists to share their perspectives about the challenges, specifically on women to careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or as we call it, STEM. And um, I'm glad that Peter's here, because we're also going to be talking about the role of men in breaking down these challenges. Perhaps, you know, I know for sure that you're, you're, um, you have interesting insights about that. In terms of flow, just to structure this 30 to 45 minute panel discussion a little bit, um, I will set this panel up with a few thought starters and immediately open the discussion to our panelists for this afternoon. So um, it's quite interesting what I was researching and reading up on some of the facts that um, our organizers um, gave us before this discussion to know that um, girls are significantly still underrepresented in STEM. I think, I think I still find that quite surprising considering that within Erie alone, I see a lot of scientists, women scientists and women experts. And so I really want to get to the bottom of that. What are, is that a misconception or is that um, something that's still happening, not just in Erie? Um, UNESCO data shows that only around 30% of all female students select STEM-related fields in higher education. Maybe you have kids or relatives or girls in your family that, you know, find, it, find this experience to be true for them. Uh, we'd like to hear more about that. Um, specifically, female students' enrollment is particularly low in ICT at 3%, natural science, mathematics, and statistics, statistics at 5%, and in engineering and manufacturing and construction at only 8%. Meanwhile, in the workplace, this is interesting for us, specifically, around 30% of the world's scientific and technological researchers are women. So um, I'd like to now, you know, without saying much, I would like to now open the floor to maybe to Martina first, if you could react to a few of the thought starters that I just gave you, personal experiences that you've had as, you know, an active player in science and, and technology, specifically in agriculture. Well, in my past years in science, in research in particular, I've not noticed, um, I've not had the experience of being a minority. I've always been uh, in, um, I mean, biology is an area where it's kind of border science, and there's more uh, uh, women represented than other um, hard sciences. So I have not experienced that. But I had seen that when starting working in the agriculture industry. Uh, certain companies have a, a major uh, component of male in their, in their workforce. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I lead. <laughs> Is it a specific experience from the research or the private sector? At the private sector, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So in the private sector, this is still happening, and it's a major concern. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's um, uh, leaders are, are very aware of this, uh, that uh, the leading roles are still mostly filled by, um, by males. That's interesting, because when you think about it, private sector 
um, the private sector normally have would have. You would assume that they would have funds for investments in these kinds of things. Um, why do you think there's still that gap? Um, well, uh, because this is, some, in my opinion, this is something that uh, you make efforts now with uh, teenagers or kids, and you will see those efforts reflected in the leader roles in 20 or 30 years, right? So I think that all these uh, few females in their 40s or 50s um, occupying uh, leading roles are the uh, very few um, women that are representing very few women that were into sci and do into this uh, um, science, technology, and engineering careers maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. So I really hope that all these efforts, all this uh, um, uh, awareness that we are having is really going to be reflected in the next coming 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Right? What about you, Pauline? Um, so I think uh, the situation has improved. We have more women in science, in STEM, um, but uh, there's certainly more that is needed. So while at the entry level at the universities, you find that uh, we have more women who are joining the science uh, career, but you tend to have more dropping out of science careers right after college, such that when you go uh, into the employment uh, sector, you find that there are less women in the science uh, careers. Mm -hmm. and I think some of it is because of the natural or the, 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 the traditional biases that we've had. So the bias is that STEM is for men and uh, uh, there are conditions in the, in the system that make it easier for men to pursue their careers in STEM mm -hmm. more than women. Mm -hmm. So you gave an example of uh, Erie having um, many uh, women in science and in many women uh, who are experts in uh, different uh, uh, se sections uh, in Erie. I think we need to look at it uh, uh, by disaggregating by uh, level. Mm -hmm. As you go up the, 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 the leadership, you find that there are less and less women in, in those leadership positions. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's just some of these uh, conscious and some of these are unconscious biases and inequality that uh, have been there for a long time. We need to uh, productively talk about these biases uh, so that we can uh, effect actionable change in the workplace so that we uh, gain inclusion and equity for women. Have you had specific um, experiences in the past wherein there was a more deliberate action from um, from companies you've probably been a part of, or colleagues, or even your direct teammates, um, as their own effort to you know to addressing this conscious or unconscious bias. So you you are asking if uh, they have uh, consciously or unconsciously tried to be more inclusive? I guess because I just want to maybe paint a clearer picture of what those efforts are. You know, that's not that's beyond putting more women leaders in leadership positions. Are there any other ways that we can narrow this sort of um, gap or lessen this conscious or unconscious bias in the workplace? Not necessarily your experience here, but maybe elsewhere. Well, uh, so the thing is, in the workplace, um, the issue of bias is uh, not a comfortable um, subject to talk about. So we often end up ignoring it. We don't talk about it, so it doesn't get addressed. Um, we all know what is politically correct, what is politically right, but, and we end up paying a lot of lip service without actually practically addressing the issues to do with uh, gender. And um, there's another layer uh, with gender. Maybe that I am aware of because of uh, my race. So there's gender and there's also race uh, that will also influence this bias and uh, equality in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about you? Yes. Well, thank you for having me on this conference. And 
I must admit, I'm also guilty of bias. I remember the first day, <laughs> Martina, your husband and your children were in front of the cafe, and I just assumed that your husband was the one joining oh. Erie <laughs> with the and then, Oh my God, I mean, what did I do? So, you know, sure. It's okay. I'm conscious. <laughs> you know, it's just... Um, yeah. uh, so that I hope this will not, not happen to me at least again. And may it be a lesson to anybody else that you really think, okay, fine. Anybody you encounter could be the scientist. It doesn't have to be the guy. It can be the... Um, and, well, you, you mentioned the topic uh, of, of race. And in one of my previous jobs as an auditor, we were auditing uh, coffee farming uh, villages um, on the island of Bali. And... Uh, in Indonesia, you have transmigration, so you would have uh, uh, Muslim villages who have come from Java and resettled on Bali. So we were auditing both villages uh, side by side, and one of the requirements we check is whether women and men are paid the same for the same type of work. And in one village, they said, yeah, sure, people, you know, women, men, they get the same pay. In the other village, it was, you know, people came up with all kinds of excuses why women were, were paid less. And they, you know, very, so it, there's culture, there's race that, that I think also takes a lot of responsibility to, to, to overcome. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, unfortunately, we still face it. Can I jump in sure. on what uh, he has uh, said about uh, assuming uh, Martina's husband was the scientist? <laughs> so um, I often meet uh, people, mostly men, but I should say also women uh, scientists. Some of them uh, are my juniors who have read my papers. You know, on the papers, it doesn't write my full, na my full name. Like, my first name is not written. They, we just use our initials. So when they meet me, they often say, Oh, you are a woman. <laughs> Just to reflect that uh, when people read uh, anything about science, the first notion that comes mm. to mind is this yeah, person is a man. Mm. And I know that uh, uh, many times when I'm um, uh, reviewing papers or some publications, I often uh, correct some sentences where the, read, the, the, the authors are writing he when they are citing a paper. And I often say, how do you know it's a he? How do you know it's not a she? Because there's that natural bias uh, to think that the science, the good science, is done by men. How does this sort of common, quote-unquote common con misconception affect you? Like not just on a professional level, but even on an emotional level. Let's take it there. For me, it's a challenge. I don't get <laughs> offended at all. Mm. For me, it's, it's, it's uh, nurturing, right? It's, uh, I take it as a challenge, really. Mm -hmm. You feel the same way? Mm -hmm. In a way, yes. Um, <laughs> I think um, the, the initial feeling is, oh, so I'm counted among the, 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 the men. Like, yeah. So that is prestigious, right? And then you stand back and you say, just because a few of us have made it doesn't mean that the landscape is much better for the rest of the women. Yeah. So they still need for us to fight to make sure that there's inclusion of every woman who is interested in doing uh, what we do. Exactly. And then I would have this need of uh, um, thinking, what can I do to change this? How can I help one girl, two girls... Uh, I'm not going to change the world, but how can I uh, make one girl uh, actually succeed in, in, uh, in one of these careers uh, through my coaching, my understanding, my uh, um, female vision of, of doing science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting now, just maybe 10, 15 minutes into the discussion, we've already unearthed you know, several layers. So there's economics, there's race, there's gender, there's culture. Uh, but I actually want to just drive our um, next point of our discussion to the economic side. So we know that 
women have more than enough skills and capabilities to contribute to the whole STEM track. But the, all these challenges are affecting their entry or their retention within that space. And it's hurting our economic, um, as an economic driver, I think it's, it's a disadvantage. Um, I've read that jobs in science and technology are some of the fastest growing worldwide and that 90% of future jobs will require information and communication technology skills. If you hear earlier, there are a lot of girls going into ICT. So it's great that I've seen this firsthand that a lot of the women scientists and, and science experts that I've met and worked with bring up with them their fellow women. But I guess I'm curious how... Or were there any instances in the workplace where you've actually encouraged men to help in that process? To help, you know, gather around, around, rally around the specific cause of supporting more our women colleagues. Peter, you can also answer this question if you've had personal experiences as well. Or do you find it particularly challenging to involve men in this sort of... I, I think I'm, I've always had... Uh, excellent female leaders mm. uh, since my um, bachelor degree until today mm. I've always had very good female leaders so I've been, I think I've been shaped by um, women leadership mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't have experience in, with men <laughs> that, that would have been my line so <laughs> looking back at my, my, my short career with the, the women I had as uh, supervisors were, were exceptional. Uh, really, the, the style of uh, um, showing understanding, showing uh, compassion, creating a, a positive atmosphere in the team. Um, not that it's generally true for, for, for all women in, in leadership positions, and I've also had excellent men in, as, as supervisors, but the ones that, yeah, the women I had the pleasure to, to work with as leaders, those they, they really shaped also my understanding of, mm -hmm. of teamwork and supporting other colleagues. Just by looking at the statistics, it's not very, you know, it's not really looking really nice for women considering a career in STEM. Um, are there a specific experiences that you like to share with them just to, you know, just to ex exhibit the reality that it's not all bad? that there are actually opportunities out there for, for women in science. Do you have specific advice or anecdotes that you probably want to share where you actually felt that, hey, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right career. Well, that's a, a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to respond to that. But um, I think uh, it goes back to passion. Um, if uh, you are passionate about something, I think it's important to pursue that passion. But uh, I need to recognize that passion alone is not enough because we need supporters. We need allies. The allies are usually the men because they are usually the ones who are dominating this uh, industry. So we need men to step forward and really provide that uh, environment to encourage girls mm -hmm. to participate in STEM, but also to remain in STEM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And there's key, uh, the key there is um, being able to fulfill all your uh, life aspects, that is also your personal life. So uh, being able to uh, become a mom, uh, to uh, be able to um, to be uh, um, uh, a mom um, and at the same time doing science. It's, it's something that though there are several um, aids for women, there is still a lot of things that, that could be brought there. Yeah, there's, I think there is a lot, a lot more to be, to be done, done there to, to help um, women, especially when uh, women are in, uh, doing leave, maternity leave, yeah, I actually want to uh, support that uh, because um, women often get penalized because we have uh, other roles 
that uh, are different from uh, what men uh, have to do. Traditional roles. Traditional roles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Traditional gender roles. Yeah. So the example that you mentioned of maternity leave, they, you see when you're coming to evaluation, people forget that you had a year when you were on maternity and uh, your productivity is ex expected to be different yeah. from that of men. But we tend to not uh, consider uh, that. And we miss due dates for fellowship, for grants, because we are on leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah? That's true. That's, and nothing has been done there, yeah? Yeah, and then uh, sometimes uh, you, you asked about uh, other women, uplifting other women. This is uh, generally the case. But I've had uh, situations where there are women who are more competitive and they create a space which make it difficult for other women to grow up and become like them because it, it is prestigious for them to remain uh, just a few of them to become like uh, the few elite uh, at the top so uh, in where I come from I have experienced uh, with uh, some women in leadership who do not create that uh, environment to bring up other women to grow into those leadership positions well, I'm from Germany. We have a Chancellor Merkel who, who you know, you could also question, was, was she able to create enough uh, momentum for, for fellow women to, to have a career in, in politics? She was also a scientist. She was a, yeah. But then if you look at the, 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 the numbers in Germany, the pay gap between men and women is still much higher than the European difference uh, mm -hmm. average and um, so I think it you you really have to also look at a bit of the history in, in Germany for example to give you an odd example um, women's soccer was more or less illegal until in the 1970s and they didn't have a World Cup for women till 1991 and when the German women who were you know, passionate about soccer since the 1950s wanted to participate in the World Cup, they were told, no, no, you have to pay your own ticket. Mm -hmm. is, you know, is, they were given all kinds of funny rules on the length of the game and the size of the ball. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of women were told too long enough in the past by men, you know, what, what is good for them or what they should do and... Uh, I think this is hopefully changing and, and already changing now. So, yeah. so there is no support for women to pursue uh, some of uh, what they want to do. So, if men are, are supported to to compete in soccer, why don't we support um, women to also mm -hmm. compete in soccer? Mm -hmm. uh, the, going back to the issue of uh, Angela Merkel and other women leaders, so I don't blame the women. I think it's the environment in which the women are leading. It's because they do not want to seem like they are simply promoting women for the sake of promoting women. It's the environment that is there that yeah. makes it difficult for them to, to actively push for other women to grow into their leadership yeah. positions. Yeah. yeah, but I still think that we have to, we cannot just uh, uh, dismiss the difference that exists between men and women. Mm -hmm. It's not, we should not uh, take this as uh, women and men are the same because they are not. We, mm -hmm. have, um, we have so many differences that uh, really would enrich the workplace mm -hmm. because of our uh, diversity in, in skills and, and competencies. Mm -hmm. And we really have to be wise enough to make use of, of these individualities. Mm -hmm. So in an in ideal world, if we have that kind of dynamic that's healthy and nurturing and, you know, mm. a right level of com competitiveness for both men and women, what investments do you think would help drive that forward? Are there specific programs that you feel should be introduced in the workplace such that when there are newcomers um, 
being introduced, they feel safe, they feel supported, they feel like this is a place that I can actually grow my career as a woman in science. I just think that good leadership will bring that, mm. among with other things. Good leadership will acknowledge mm -hmm. if a woman really has all the potential to, to become a leader herself, good, a good leader would identify that and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and um, assist and aid in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to continue talking about it. Mm. Talk about these issues, these uncomfortable issues, so that we actually address them. Mm -hmm. So there are these biases, the, the conscious biases are easy to, to address. But the unconscious biases, it becomes really difficult unless you continuously talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example. Mm -hmm. um, so um, generally when you want to make a decision, it, it, a good decision is made by considering sort of different uh, array of options, right? Uh, so when a man um, takes time to consider, takes time and put, looks at uh, different options uh, before making a decision, when a man does that, it's considered that they are strategic. Mm -hmm. It's considered that they are contemplative, they are looking into issues before they make a decision. If a woman does that, she's usually considered to be indecisive. Mm -hmm. It's just a notion which is unconscious, but it's there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people go out there and say, because this is a woman, we are going to treat her differently. Mm -hmm. This is a man, we are going to treat her diff differently. So these are unconscious biases. And the only I think one of the ways that we can address this is by continuously talking about it so that we become aware of it. Mm -hmm. Because in many times when you talk to people about some of these biases, people do not realize what they are doing until you point it out mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. but this is happening. Mm -hmm. And then people say, uh-huh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's not that people want to be uh, biased. It's mm -hmm. just something that is happening. It's mm -hmm. part of the historical uh, right. sort of uh, biases mm -hmm. that we have carried from uh, generations. So in other words, if it's like, if we're going to identify what that actually looks like, for example, as a policy, an HR maybe directive, that could probably be like a more open sort of channels where we can direct these kinds of feedback in terms of our experiences working with mm -hmm. others, maybe, you know, more gender bias awareness programs or perhaps um, workshops, including both men and women in this workshop so that, you know, these biases become more, less unconscious and more, you know, more conscious yeah. about yeah. how we can avoid them. Yeah. So just, you know, these are things that perhaps could, you know, we could invest more in or not just at Erie, but, you know, somewhere else if it's a problem that um, could potentially help us, you know, finally, maybe equality is, is too far off, but, you know, at least we get closer to that. Um, at this point, I, don't, I just... I yeah. don't think it's too far off. It's we, not. We just need to work for it. We just okay. need to work towards it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about introducing some of these programs. It's about promoting them. Mm -hmm. Because many times, because this is not in line with what I do for science, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the year, if I participate in this program, what uh, productivity is, is going to be measured against me mm -hmm. at the end of the year? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pr uh, promoting these programs to be uh, part of important um, sort of... Uh, I don't know what word to use, but to be important for the for the organization, right. really. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah I, preparing for today, I was uh, reading about you know that the ILO had already come up with with conventions in the 1950s, and and but then again, the example of Germany in in recent years, they they've introduced legislation requirements that. That would, you know, uh, uh, facilitate uh, more transparency also on on, on, on salaries between uh, for for women and men to see whether they are being uh, discriminated, mm -hmm. and still it's not being implemented. So there is such a resistance mm. that that, as you say, takes yeah. Uh, yeah. either a generation or it will. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know what it will take, but that's why I came up with this example of, of soccer. You know, we are not, it's not that long ago that people still looked at, at women in Germany mm -hmm. as, you know, not even, you know, you, you're belonging behind the stove, not, you know, on the soccer pitch. So that, to, to change that in a society will, will take, yeah, yeah we, we have no time to and lose. We are, we are talking, but I think we still have to walk the talk. Yeah. Yes. yeah in many cases. Because um, I um, appreciate you were here, and um, but uh, I mean this is something that takes a little time mm -hmm. in your year. Mm -hmm. So if you really uh, uh, promote and support um, women in um, in in science and in uh, taking leadership roles, um, then I think you can make an hour of your time yearly to take part on these kind of activities. It's not just uh, supporting with a talk or with a, a sharing communication, but it's something that you really have to act and put some a bit more effort mm -hmm. to make that actually happen. So those are all interesting thoughts that we can, you know, put together in our summary for later. But just an interesting thing, because you mentioned publications earlier, I just want to get this out there because it's an interesting point that we could clarify in this panel discussion. Misconception or truth? Paid less, publish less. Women in STEM fields publish less and are paid less for their research and do not progress as far as men in their careers. Is there any truth to this? I am not a woman in science, particularly, but maybe you can share some thoughts about it this. It happens everywhere, <laughs> not just in science. <laughs> it, it so happens that uh, the, the job um, area, the job arena is uh, male-dominated, has remained male-dominated yeah. because women have been relegated to domestic And jobs. there is this preconcept that women are going to <laughs> be more absent, less responsible, they're going to put their kids before their jobs, mm -hmm. and then, because of that, they have to get paid less. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you heard of the concept of uh, glass ceiling? Mm -hmm. So women face this glass ceiling where, um, because of, of being a woman, when... Um, when the leaders uh, select you to lead uh, some aspect, it's considered to be high risk. So you find that uh, uh, they are not willing to really pay you more because you're already at risk. Uh, they, are, they are not sure that you're going to perform in the workplace. And with publications, it's, it's really uh, interesting. <laughs> um, I think on one end we talk about uh, the number, on the other we talk about quality. Mm -hmm. So we need to just get uh, the balance of uh, having good quality and uh, good numbers out there. Do you have anything to add? Well, just to clarify, I'm, I'm not a person who's publishing a lot. Huh? I have an NGO background. I, I came here on a, on, a, on, a, on a different mission, so I, I have great respect for all your publications. And, and, you know, I wouldn't even be capable of it. So, but then, yeah, yeah. I, I, from what I pick up in the coffee shop, yeah, there, 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 there are still cases where people, you know, are put on the spot, you know, about the, the quality of their publication, and, and we have to be careful that we are not, you know, biased in, right. in gender when we, when we evaluate pe people and that we are yeah. Yeah, transparent well, and fair in that is analysis. Well, considering that uh, it's easier for a well-known scientist to publish than for a new week. Yeah. So, and uh, you have more male uh, uh, known publishers, right? Or more or, um, principal scientists, or, or um, um, so I don't. I see why this could be biased, right? Biased. It's more. Uh, you don't have as many women in the position that everything they write will be published. <laughs> so, um, yeah, very interesting insights. I would just like to give the floor to everyone to just leave our audience with, you know, last bits of um, information or learning that you got gathered from this panel discussion.
maybe Martin, you, uh, Martina, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, thank you for having me. I just, um, um, I really, uh, this is a very important matter for me. And um, I do um, advise leaders to to be to be conscious of this um, inequality within uh, women and men, and um, support women in, in in this business. Yeah. So I would like to thank you for the opportunity to air my views uh, on this topic. I don't think I'm qualified to talk about gender because I'm not a gender specialist, uh, but I do experience gender um, equality inequalities in the workplace, and uh, I think it's important that we really uh, consciously address uh, some of these uh, biases that we have in the workplace. I was reading... Um, uh, a Gates uh, report called Goalkeepers 2019 and this graph re resonated very well with me. So what this graph shows is uh, starting out ahead. Where you are born is more predictive of your future than any other factor. So there are different layers. So there's geography, where you come from. There's uh, demographics, shocks and fragility, socioeconomics, governance. So Bill and Melinda, they gave their sort of examples. The, the top one is uh, Bill. He has few hurdles. Uh, Melinda, uh, Melinda has some hurdles, mostly the gender, because uh, she comes from a good place. And then there are people born in the Sahel. Uh, you know, there are different layers. I find myself to be one of those who are right at the bottom, uh, where... I, each step of the way, there are hurdles that I have to climb. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to make it um, um, known by other people what you are facing, what you are experiencing. So I think it requires a leadership uh, that has humility and empathy to allow them to embrace people from different backgrounds. Because uh, I think once we are given the platform to contribute, we can uh, all contribute uh, the diverse sort of uh, contributions that we make, which uh, are important for the organization. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned something about equity and equality. Maybe you could just share a bit more about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. I think it, it has to do with the point that Peter was making uh, about uh, providing women scientists and I, I like uh, an environment to allow them to work. I, I don't know if that's something that you wanted to to, to uh, conclude on or? Well, we were actually off video for a while, so we had a discussion about um, something a, a fellow uh, scientist shared with me today, that uh, for her it's very important that, that ERI provides um, the infrastructure that allows her to, you know, uh, bring her children to work. She's a, she's a single mother. And then also uh, having a, a supervisor who is fully understanding of, of her situation and fully supportive. So, yeah, I think uh, the, the, wherever it, an infrastructure can be provided that levels out some of these hurdles and then again have, you know, walking the talk, as you said earlier, so that we are actually giving the support to, to women in science and, and that will make it easier for them to. Yeah, and that's the point that I was talking about, uh, equality and uh, equity. Uh, so um, we are different people. We come from different backgrounds, so we are not equal. But if we want to talk about equity, we want to address the different uh, um, backgrounds that we have so that we provide support that is needed to bring those who are from less, uh, uh, or rather from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds to come to the same level or to a, to a level which allows them to uh, contribute effectively to the organization. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, I, I guess the, the key thing that really stood out to me in this whole discussion, that's pretty much the recap of everything, but <laughs> what stood out to me was that we keep, somehow there's a certain level of pressure or expectations towards men to be champions of women. But it, I, I found it quite interesting. I'm not a mom at the moment, not yet. But I found it interesting that you had experiences wherein women were actually part of the issue, of the challenge. And so um, I think I want to leave this discussion with that, that the support needs to come from different, you know, different sides. If not, it's not just on the men to help you know, mm -hmm. bring equity or equality in the workplace for women, but it's also women and women working together to make sure that you know, everybody, you know, everybody gets to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. I think, so then, and if you allow me to add, sure. this doesn't start when you start working. This starts at home when you're a kid and your mom treats the same you and your brother. So when uh, you're both uh, treated the same way, then uh, you don't get these, um, these wrong ideas that you can't do what you actually can. Mm -hmm. So that was my last message. Thank you. I think that's uh, the idea of uh, sisterhood. Mm -hmm. So trying to hold each other's hands so that we can, uh, uh, like women from different backgrounds, to work together to contribute or to uh, fight against the bias and the inequalities that we face. And it also means, it doesn't mean just sisterhood among women. Uh, Peter can be uh, part of the sister yeah. and uh, be an ally to, <laughs> to the women to contribute uh, to uh, our advancement in the workplace. That's right. And with that, I would like to thank you guys again, okay. Martina, Pauline, and um, Peter for this very insightful discussion. This will not be the first and the last, I hope. Um, as you said, it's the small things that we can do as part of an organization so that we can you know, make small steps into achieving not just, you know, equality in the workplace, not just for women, but for everybody else. So once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> thank you, guys. I did. <laughs>